Welcome, everybody. This is Hugh Massey, the founder and CEO of DNA Behaviour International. And today I'm delighted to be hosting another identity conversation. And I have with me Amy Lochter, who is the owner and president of Maximum Impact Partners. And I've known Amy and also her husband, John, who works in, in Maximum Impact Partners as well for, for the past 10 years or so. And uh, they've been uh, great uh, clients and users of, of business DNA, you know, through through that time across the financial services industry. So, so welcome, Amy. Thank you. <laughs> so it's it's great to spend some time with you. So, if you'd just like to to tell our audience a little bit about your your life and background, and you know how you got to the place of setting up Maximum Impact Partners. You know, it, it's uh, the journey has was uh, really um, the journey was a good one. When I graduated from Indiana University on a Saturday, I started uh, my career at Nuveen on uh, that Monday, and I was fortunate to like. I think that my my real goal at the time was I was interested in being in the financial services industry, but I think at the time I was mostly interested in having a paycheck, <laughs> yeah. as I recall. And, uh, and so it's sort of like aiming at the right place, pretty big target, but getting to a great company that was uh, offered all kinds of opportunities to advance. And I ended up um, you know, advancing through everything that you could possibly do in sales and distribution, inside sales, outside sales, uh, national accounts, national sales manager, um, I headed a division there. And all of that was, you know, really kind of being aligned with a great company and discovering, even though I don't think, Hugh, I would have ever said that I was aiming for a career in sales. It really, uh, I found it to be natural. You know, I enjoyed it. And I really did enjoy the process of connecting with people in the sales process, even more than I enjoyed managing people. But that managing people was a big part of what I did. And, um, but I also started a family. And so the, the long story and the long and short story of it is uh, that I wanted to have more flexibility in my career to make decisions for myself about what I would commit to and what I wouldn't commit to so that motherhood would align with my career. Yeah. And really, that was my primary motivator for wanting to have my own business. And John had already started Maximum Impact Partners. And to me, it really was at that point in my life, the flexibility of uh, aligning my work, which is very important to me with um, being a parent. And so we got it off the ground. And actually, the, the, the story of it, Hugh, is... Um, I was waiting for John to come back from a business trip so that I could go get on a plane and leave the following morning. He was going to meet me and our three kids at home and he was late. So I put the kids in the car and we drove to O'Hare and now we are in the United, you know, red carpet club and I'm waiting, pacing, waiting for John, knowing my flight's about to take off. And if you've ever been to the Chicago um, red carpet club, there's an escalator and so John was coming up the escalator and I was going down the escalator and just imagine we've got three kids at the top of the escalator, our oldest with the baby and on her hip. And you know, so three kids at the top, John and I crossing. And I said to John, we're never doing this again, <laughs> ever. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. And that really led to this, you know, what now is 23 years of Maximum Impact Partners and, uh, you know, quite delightful, uh, really, I think, in terms of all the things we've been able to do at Maximum Impact Partners, no shortage of exciting things. Uh, but that really was the, that really made a difference to kind of leave the corporate world behind and start into a consulting business instead. Yeah, I think it's, well, it's clearly a great opportunity for you, particularly as a as a working mom, to be able to have that kind of flexibility. Yeah, to somewhat you know, control your own time, but you don't always true. get that chance, do you? 
Yeah, well, you know, the thing is, I think now there's more, I think companies are more aware of the need for that. Yeah. Uh, it, and I think there is more flexibility inside of a corporate career at the, it, right now than there was even when we, 23 years ago, when we started this business. Uh, but for sure, I think the alignment in, in work with what feels right to you, uh, what feels natural to you, like listening to your heart and doing what, there's no downside to that. That is really the discovery is that I didn't have to keep doing what I was doing. I could make another decision and still have um, opportunities available. So it was not a limiter. Yeah, and you've been, yeah, you've been lucky to do that. And, and, and in a way in life, Amy, I think you make your own luck. Yeah. And, but it took, courage, it took courage, though, to back yourself and, and John to do that with three kids and to know that at the end of the day, you could make that work, make marriage work and, 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 and life work. That's so, right. Yeah. But, but all through that time, you've concentrated on sales and sales distribution. Absolutely. It, and only in financial services. So we really narrowed our, um, our connection with the idea that we would help financial service companies um, with all distribution and marketing initiatives that they had. And our, our original thought was that we would help companies that didn't have access to um, a, a large pool of talent, you know, smaller financial service companies. And that was our original aim, was to get medium-sized asset managers to uh, improve their distribution strategy. And we did that. I mean, we still have clients that I would consider to be medium-sized asset managers, but we also work with large asset managers too. And that is, you know, the bigger the company, the bigger the demand. Uh, and a medium-sized company is still, you know, making tracks to grow. But we feel like we're pretty well positioned to help companies get to the next place that they want to go in terms of uh, really making connections with advisors. Yeah, from my experience, you've worked with all, all levels of firms, you know, John Hancock and, and, and going downwards. I mean, they're, 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 they're some of the biggest brands right. out there with, with huge teams. Yes, right. So, and, I, you know, I, I know that just from the, the being in the industry, the brands, but also the, uh, the activity in our system. So, um, you know, I, I think you've succeeded there. But, Amy, tell me just a little bit more about sort of what your success factor has been in, in helping these firms with their distribution. There's something special you do because you've been doing that for 23 years, very pinpointed. Right. I, I think I would pinpoint it. First, I would pinpoint that I am a professional observer of the sales process. I, um, I, I learned to do this, but I, I feel that one real connection point is focusing on the observation of what really is happening in the sales process and then being able to dissect it. I mean, really it's the observation. I understood that as a manager, when I was a sales manager, I wasn't observing the sales process. I was checking for accuracy. So as a sales manager, I would be out with my salespeople thinking, do they have the facts right? Did they say that correctly? But I really was not an observer of the sales process itself, which is, was there a connection made? Did the salesperson ask questions? Did they propose a solution at the time that it was the appropriate time to propose a solution? And did they listen and propose the right solution? You know, did they uh, recommend the right action step, the right next step to take? And did they ask for the business? And I feel that, you know, I've, I'm, a, I'm professionally observe that because these people don't work for me. <laughs> I have the advantage of stepping back and saying, am I seeing the execution of this process? And I've observed it in the US because I've run teams myself, but now we work with clients in the United States. But what's fascinating to me is the process is the same in every country that we've worked in. And yeah. it, in really, Hugh, it's really forces the more of an observation that you're watching uh, the process 
And not only is it not your company, it's not your country. <laughs> and it's not even your language. And I'm still observing that the most important part in the sales process is the connection with the person that you're talking to. It is being curious and then listening and proposing something based on that simple thing, curiosity and listening. And, and if I, but if I were to say the, the, the piece of all of this and the observation that I have, uh, when people ask me what it is that I do, I say that I, I help my clients make better connections with their clients. That's my job. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that is a fabulous job to have. <laughs> but but in, in, in helping, in helping the salespeople make better connections, you're not just handing them a list and saying, go and farm this list no. um, of names. You're very much focused on their behavior. Did they build that emotional connection? Yes. Without a doubt. I mean, I think that it's the, that's actually what the observation is, is about the, uh, are you witnessing someone who is um, really being authentically themselves? There, there really isn't just one way of, of doing it. There's many ways of being successful. There's many ways of making a successful connection, many. And so there's no formula to it. And I think that I really rejected things that were formulaic that do these steps and you will be successful. It's, I think that my philosophy or really my observation of all of this is be yourself and you will be successful. Be free to be you, lead with curiosity uh, and you will be successful. And then put the process on top of that, but first be yourself. And then second, tighten up what you're doing just a little bit by adding a little bit of process to that. That is, that's what, that's what I see. I really think that I had rejected as a sales manager off the shelf sales training programs because I felt there was not enough of it that really resonated. There were pieces of it. There's always like, there's always a good nugget. Uh, great ideas come from a lot of places but as a sales manager, I really had a hard time feeling like there was anyone that really understood what my team was doing and understood the people they needed to make uh, be connected to and, and advisors that they needed to help uh, those advisors with their businesses. And I, I feel like I kind of stepped into sales training as I, and I would say I'm, it's a, it's the perspective on selling from a salesperson's point of view. I didn't really even call it training. I thought that I was really saying, let's talk about how we approach a relationship with a client from my point of view, which is the sale, like it was a salesperson's point of view. Like let's, let's break it down. And that is the, um, I think that that's really where, we, we've never really let go of that. Um, and it, it's, it's one thing that getting started with a client, it's more, it's more difficult to put that into words really, because having a laminated process <laughs> is what's expected. <laughs> but the process actually is uh, something that is unique to the culture of the firm and the people who are there. And I want that people part to be first and then the process to be added to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to observe the culture of the firm and recognize right. all of that. And then, and then when you step into a team, how, how, do you, how do you know that you've been successful and how does the team know that you've been successful with this approach, because it's not just about looking at numbers and data. This is looking at the people. You're almost observing the people in the process. No doubt. And that we, you know, we started, um, we started an assessment center so that we could get some data around how people's skills improved from having worked with us. And we call that the combine. Um, it's uh, skill drills that we run people through. But that's more to gather the data. I, I would say the way I know that 
um, that we've been successful is that salespeople advance. And as they advance, they come back and say, it really was the, um, the confidence that, was, that, that I got from working with you. It, I, it really helped me. Uh, the idea for structuring how I cover my territory, it really made me more organized. Like w- the, the witness, the eyewitness point of view of, boy, that really worked. And I think the ultimate compliment is when I hear a salesperson take an idea that I had passed along to them and they repeat it or the company adopts it and it's like their own. Yeah. And that's like the best If the idea becomes the company's idea, I feel like that's really when you know that the the concepts that you have and the the help you've provided has really resonated. And and, and so, Amy, when you work work with teams, like sales teams, and you're observing the sales team and, and each person in there, but how do you how do you sort of teach this to, to all of them? You observe the process, but each of them are doing probably following the process a little bit uniquely, and you're pinpointing each person. Right. It's really uh, well. It really, it starts with like helping the managers understand what's the you know, what what the team is made up of, and uh, and really, business DNA has been is a really is a, a critical component of how we assess the way that a team operates together. Yeah. And uh, business DNA provides like a shorthand insight that without the years of just spending doing nothing but observing, <laughs> business DNA takes all that observation and puts it down onto one piece of paper. And I feel like it's mostly illuminating for a management team to understand the simple concept that someone who is a highly analytical person is going to approach the sales process in a different way than someone who is really a very spontaneous person. And what I've witnessed in the past is that managers who are very analytical want their salespeople to have a more analytical approach. Yeah. And so I really feel that opening the door to say, look at this is successful and this is successful. And now your job as a manager is to encourage each of these natural behaviors, not do the impossible task of changing their natural behavior, but make the most of what this person has to offer. And that is like lifting a cover off of, you know, the, uh, a flashlight and the light that comes from a manager who now sees that it's not their job to uh, be, Uh, to put a process in place that orders everyone to behave the same way. Their job is really one to embrace the nature of the team as they operate. And then also like the getting a manager to see that getting a sales manager to see how their team is put together. And I think also from a business DNA standpoint, they can see how they connect with each person on their team and understand how to coach them. And even the words to use, how, like, what, what to, they stop taking things personally. They stop feeling so the need to control things. Yeah. So, Hugh, really, business DNA has been the uh, integral part of how we make teams uh, form. Uh, we make the team form in a, uh, a better way. We get them to be more comfortable with each other, their communication ends up being better, they trust each other more, they forgive each other more, they laugh more, there's levity in the team. And then the manager also from uh, having this insight that comes from knowing how the team is uh, put together through the business DNA. They also have help through recruiting. What am I looking for? And uh, that is another important part of team formation. And I don't think that as I said, and you and I have talked about this before, and certainly Leon uh, and I have talked about this a lot, business DNA is not an eliminator of a person from a role. It doesn't, it's never, I would never use, in fact, I reject that you would use business DNA in a way that would say this person is not right for this role. Because that is, 
it's simply not true. I've just seen success in every type of behavior. And instead, it's really more about understanding the talent you have in front of you, not eliminating people that don't display certain traits. Yeah, I think that, it, you know, I've, I've seen that too, that with salespeople, you can, you know, you're, I'm an initiator style, you're an influencer style. Uh, I've seen um, reflective thinkers or a facilitator style. They're, they're, they're some of our 10 styles for the benefit of our listeners. Right. will be successful with in sales. Uh, they do better if they're going to be more successful, I think, as you've already been saying, if, if one is authentic. Right. Um, but there's got to be enough drive there. I think the only thing I would say is if there's enough competitive drive. Right. And that is a a fact a, a, a sub factor in there if that's strong enough then probably the person can do anything they want it's then a matter of mastering themselves and understanding who they're in front of might be different right. and how to adapt their communication and i think that's really what you're saying is you know you can come from any of the 10 styles that we have have any of the makeups um, you understand yourself really well and you've got enough competitive drive you can make it work. Not all have the competitive drive to really want to go hard enough. Um, they, but there's still they, a place for them on the team. There's a place for them on the team. And I think that that's the, that's the insight is that yeah. you can do what you want with, with your want to. And you don't have competitive drive, but you do want the compensation associated with being a professional salesperson. And I have said to people who look like that to me, no doubt you could do it and you'll win. The question is whether you can sustain it and whether you would want to sustain it. So it's not a matter of can you do it, it's will you want to do it over a long period of time. And I think even for a sales manager to understand that, that's fine. You know, we have about a three to four year turnover uh, in roles. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily complete turnover, but you're really looking at like you as a manager can, people can move along to another role on the team that uh, is better for them and better for the company. So I'm, uh, I, without that insight, it's really, without the business DNA insight, it's hard to it's hard to really see where it's coming from. You, you, I think managers have replaced what they thought was uh, a performance issue with instead a coaching and a the right role issue. And the bigger the company, the greater the chance there is for someone to actually be assigned to the right role. In a smaller company, they move on, and I think that's also fine. People yeah. move on, and you know they're they 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 get another role, and you know that that's also better for them, better for the company. So I, I don't think that's a problem either. Yeah, and sometimes there's a culture fit. You know, a, yeah. a, one firm's got a particular style. That's not that's just not going to fit the values of a person. Perhaps they're better not being there, but they'll be more successful in another environment. And that's right. It's still, it's still in sales because I think we've got to remember sales is very broad. That's uh, right. As well. But, you know, I think the point that's really strong here is, though, is your ability to pick whether someone – is capable of connecting with the with the with the clients or the people that they're selling to. That's exactly right. That's that, the that's that's the that's the very special piece. Business DNA can sort of help you see that right. a, a certain style of person will connect with certain styles types of clients. Why aren't they connecting with other clients? That's right. Do they need to change their approach? That's uh, right. And and, and and that that is. I mean, we have we have big conversation. Um, an important conversation happening right now around the importance of diversity, which is clearly one of the most important success factors of an organization. And business DNA really offers this diversity of natural behavior, which yeah. is also an important factor. And this is my message to management teams has been, take this into consideration. This is, we've got 150,000 financial advisors that you're targeting they're going to represent every element of diversity that we could name. And natural behavior is one of those elements, which means 
we need to have every style represented in our organization to make the best connection with every style that exists out there in the universe. Yeah. And so it is, it's really, it is an element of understanding that we, we, it's important. And in a way that change, that can change the whole way a sales team's built. Correct. Um, you know, because I, I think you alluded to it before, a lot of the time their territory built. Right. That may, that may not always work because in a way, if it's one, one salesperson with a territory, there's got to be some black hole there in terms of connection. That's um, exactly right. Because, because they, because that salesperson can't connect with all of the, whether it's advisors, or whoever their, 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 their buyer is, who they're selling to. It's, it's you know, and, and at Hugh, we've done some fascinating work with uh, the business DNA has a um, comparison report and it's puts two people onto one report and we line up the internal and external salesperson onto the comparison report. And what we're looking for and what we've found is that between an internal and an external salesperson, if we put a yin and yang together, they are going to have a better way of connecting with more advisors that are assigned to them. And you have an external salesperson who says, this is a top advisor and they're right in the middle of downtown Manhattan but they are a reflective thinker and they're afraid of me because I am so uh, out there (laughs) that I really appear to be untrustworthy to them. So instead my reflective thinker internal salesperson maintains that relationship. Yeah. That is magic. That is fantastic to be able to do that. And we've actually seen there's a way to optimize internal external partnerships that really allow you to have, you know, the best of um, the, a blend of characteristics. And I've been teaching the same thing just to the advisors themselves, you know, when they deal with a client, you know, a wealth management client comes in to have two people in the room themselves and somebody else, depending on who the, who the client is to cover the different styles that might be there between a husband and wife or between partners or within a family unit. It's yeah. exactly the same thing. And, and you know, it's been amazing how some of the, the advisory practices, businesses have gone through the roof. Yes. When they've built their team to do that. I just love that. It's and, just. And, and it really, it comes down, to, you know, it comes down to matching. It comes down to, you know, and, and, and to your word, connection. Right. Um, because in a way, Amy, for you as you, you know, yourself, if we look at your business DNA style, you're a salesperson in your own right. Right, exactly. Can't um, help it. <laughs> yeah, you, you you can't you can't help it. But you're uh, you've got all the traits of a salesperson, um, being an influencer style. Um, you know, fairly gregarious. Uh, you know, fun fun to be with, connective in your in, in you know in your own right. Um, but what's taking you down the path of really in a way being an educator and observer of other salespeople rather than being the salesperson directly yourself. Yeah, I just love the, um, I really, I think that people put limits on themselves and I, uh, I love to lift the limit uh, that is just something that is, you know, the, there, there's just something in the uh, helping someone to the next level that the levels inside of them, it always was. And to lift the limit, lift the boundary. Uh, to me, that is, I, I get more joy out of that than I do in the win that belongs to me. Like I, the individual win is less important than to me in terms of overall satisfaction than it is seeing a, um, a big aha from a group of people or a just I, I like a, a confidence boost in an individual person who has really been a, um, um, helped along by uh, a conversation, a coaching session, uh, training, whatever it may be. So I think there is, it really comes down to where the greater satisfaction is. I um, have, I'm competitive, but the, the idea of, um, seeing others succeed is a, a greater uh, win for me than an individual win. 
because you know a big part of this as well is as much as you know you're you're uh, educating these salespeople to be to be better. It's you being in your own zone as well, um, and so it seems to me that you know you're very passionate about inspiring other people, right? In a way to maximise their impact through through better connections. That's um, that 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 that's what I'm what, that's what I'm sensing, and and that you're getting them to rise to a higher level by seeing how they helping them see how they can create better impact out of who they are as a person. Yes, without a doubt. I think that influence is a uh, um, influence. And it was interesting that, that my personality style, that my style, my natural behavior was influencer. And I feel like that influencing comes from listening and perceiving. And then I find myself wanting, like once I feel there is a solution there, I want to have an influence on you being able to see it. And that's where the sell part comes in yeah. to a certain extent. So I won't let go of it. Um, I won't let somebody just linger. I will really stay along with them until I feel that I really have influenced them to see what's possible. And that is a, uh, and then I feel like it's a big win. And that is a big win if you get, if you get uh, that light lifted in somebody's, uh, and for an entire team, uh, that's just a, that's a huge win. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, it's inspiring people. It's building, it's building their confidence. Right. It's, it's, it's walking the journey with them, as you say, inspiring, but I think you used the key word perceiving, uh, you can perceive what that person, you know, needs to do from what you're seeing them, what you're seeing them doing. That's exactly right. Yes, that's exactly right. So it's, it's the, so would you say it's the perceptive part that being able to, in a way, make this person feel understood, that's that perceiving them through the observation that is stronger than, in a way, the enthusiasm that you might bring in communicating to them, okay, now you need to do X. That's right. It's the, um, you know, what I hear is you get it, you know, you get it. You're a per, so that's perceiving. I, I might not even put that word on it. And it might be that I don't put that word of uh, highly perceptive on it. It comes naturally to me, but I think that that really is. It's when people say, you know, like I, you just get it. And I'll think hmm, that's it. Like I just, I do, I'm getting it. And I want you to get it. Like I want you to understand what I am perceiving is going on here. So helping problem solve really is about both perceiving, but lending that perception to someone else. I can help you see how to make a better connection because I can perceive the way the connection's actually working. So, so somewhere there it's, you know, if I, if I, if I bring this together in, you know, your identity and you know what your your x factor um but being being a you know a uh a perceptive observer right of someone's sales connection right yes. the connections they create that they're, they're creating in the in, in the sales process is really that's really the thing that, that's where your x factor is that's it that's it you're right that's the that it actually is it's it's that's what the connection actually is all about. It's perceiving, uh, it's, it's all about the perception. And there probably is an X factor in that. Um, like I, yeah, there is an X factor in the perception. Because at the end of the day, you know, the business DNA data from our systems helps you sharpen the perceptions, but you still got that, that inside you, that, you know, that in a way, yeah, I think it really does. What business DNA does is it sharpens your radar. It totally does. But you still got the radar. And what it does is it helps you put some science onto the radar to explain it to, to a person. But you still got to have that, that intuitive feeling and be able to get away from the data at times and just say, you know, to him or her, this is what I felt when I saw you connecting with ABCD person. That's, now have a look at it in this framework. That's exactly right. 
I mean, Hugh, that's really put that that is hits the nail on the head because I have felt I've had the perception, but business DNA, since I've had that tool, it lends credibility to the perception that I have. It also helps frame it for me in terms of what it is that I'm seeing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there really is that there's the perception. It was always there. <laughs> But the ability to help somebody see it is more than me just saying, I feel this, I sense this, and now I can show you what this looks like on paper. Yeah, because I think you've got to be able to show the show them that, you know, if you're if you're sitting beside the salesperson, you know whether they're gonna make the sale or not and what they did wrong or right to 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 make it or not make it. And then here's the what you now need to go and do. Here's what I saw, and this is what you need to go and do now. I think that's, um, you know, part of the tooling. How you can use the systems in a way help you create teams um, more effectively. But it's your perceiving ability in the observation process, right, of connection, of real connection, um, is important. Because when people hear connections, they're thinking, well, she's going to give me a list of leads. <laughs> you know, it's not. <laughs> That isn't what it's about, um, right? So I just wanted to make sure we got that all we got that across. But as as we wrap up, Amy, is there is there is there something else? You know, is there another suggestion you've got for uh, people building sales teams or sales leaders or the salesperson that you'd like to make out there, or a book they should read, or something they should do? Well, actually, I I think that I would like to um, just give um, pull this all together in terms of the way that. Um, how, what's important to a sales team. And we have um, asked sales managers what skills are critical for their sales team. What does the salesperson, cr- what's critical for them to know what to do and how to do in order to succeed? And there's always two pieces of this. There's the skills that are really represented by selling skills, knowledge being the biggest Uh, but sales process being up there, which includes presentation and closing and other skills. But we look at the skills, but managers will always say, when I ask them what's most important, what I have found with sales managers is they'll say, fire, desire, uh, the, the, the motivation to win. And as I've listened to this, uh, I've said, well, that's not a skill. That's an attribute. That is something that you, you'd hire attributes and then you would train and coach skills. Yeah. So we put two things together. We add both of those elements together in the Maximum Impact Partners Combine. We use skill drills for the skills. We actually score all the salespeople on where they currently stand because the next level of performance is understanding where the gaps in skills are. But the second piece, and actually maybe what managers see as the more important piece, is we also run business DNA on each salesperson. So we have a data set on every salesperson that includes where they stand on specific skills, as well as what their business DNA is, and then a coaching plan for that manager that is very specific. Uh, data oriented, a specific what you should be talking about. It is, I think the marriage of real skills and business DNA is the, the, the perfect picture for improving high performance on a sales team. Yeah, because that data is what gives you the, the performance metric at the end Absolutely. of the day. And, and is the roadmap to, to go forward. And probably there's repeatable things in there about each person, maybe slightly different. Right, there that are. Needs to be worked on. Even the A-grade players have some things that they could do, um, you know, to, to, to be better. Exactly right. All right, Amy. Well, thank you for spending time with me this afternoon. This has been uh, fantastic to, you know, to dig deeper in this and to, uh, you know, really get down to what's important in the sales process is how you create connection. <laughs> It's really great, Hugh. It's fun talking to you. I always learn something whenever I talk to you. And I really, I appreciate that we had the chance to do this too. Very, very much. Well, I appreciate 
all of what you and John do, and I'm learning a lot from both of you as well. Thanks, you.